My Nankabao People, Wikipedia article audio. My Nankabao People, also known as Minang, are an ethnic group indigenous to the My Nankabao Highlands of West Sumatra, Indonesia. Minang commonly associated with hard-working, strategic, and diplomatic. It is in their blood to migrate to create better opportunities for themselves and they're known as resilient entrepreneurs. Moreover, they carry this spirit for generations. You can see and meet them in almost every corner in Indonesia. They typically have their own business and the business itself is managed by the family and passed to their sons slash daughters slash grandchildren. Minang are especially known for their food business among many others. The Minang Kabao are the largest matrilineal society in the world, with property, family name, and land passing down from mother to daughter, while religious and political affairs are the responsibility of men, although some women also play important roles in these areas. This custom is called Lari Bodhi Kaniago and is known as Adat Perpeta in Malaysia. Today 4.2 million Minangs live in the homeland of West Sumatra. Etymology History Historiography Culture Ceremonies and festivals Performing arts Crafts Cuisine Architecture Oral traditions and literature Language Customs and religion Overseas Minangkabau Notable Minangkabau General Notes The Minangkabau are famous for their dedication to knowledge, as well as the widespread diaspora of their men throughout Southeast Asia the result being that Minangs have been disproportionately successful in gaining positions of economic and political power throughout the region. The co-founder of the Republic of Indonesia, Mohamed Hatta, was a Minang, as were the first president of Singapore, Yusuf bin Ishak, and the first supreme head of state or Yang Dipertuan Agong of Malaysia, Tuanku Abdul Rahman. The Minangkabau strongly profess to Islam while at the same time also follow their ethnic traditions, or Adat. The Minangkabau Adat was derived from animist and Hindu, Buddhist beliefs before the arrival of Islam, and remnants of animist beliefs still exist even among some practicing Muslims. The present relationship between Islam and Adat is described in the saying traditions are founded upon the law and the law founded upon the Quran. As one of the world's most populous matrilineal ethnicities, Minangkabau gender dynamics have been extensively studied by anthropologists. The Adat traditions have allowed Minangkabau women to hold a relatively advantageous position in their society compared to most patriarchal societies, as most property and other economic assets pass through female lines. The Minangkabau's West Sumatran homelands was the seat of the Pegaruyung Kingdom, believed by early Orientalists to have been the cradle of the Malay race, and the location of the Padri War. A popular legend that has it that the name is derived from a territorial dispute between a people and a prince from a neighboring region. To avoid a battle, the local people proposed a fight to the death between two water buffalo to settle the dispute. The prince agreed and produced the largest, meanest, most aggressive buffalo. The villagers on other hand produced a hungry baby calf with its small horns ground to be as sharp as knives. Seeing the adult buffalo across the field, the calf ran forward, hoping for milk. The big buffalo saw no threat in the baby buffalo and paid no attention to it, looking around for a worthy opponent. But when the baby thrust his head under the big bull's belly, looking for an udder, the sharpened horns punctured and killed the bull giving the villagers their victory. 
The legend however has its rebuttals as the word minang refers to the consumption of arica nut, yet there hasn't been any popular explanation on the word minang that relates the aforementioned action to the word for water buffalo. The first mention of the name Minangkabau as Minangatamwan, is in the late 7th century Kadukan Bukit inscription, describing Sri Jayanasa's sacred journey from Minangatamwan accompanied with 20.000 soldiers heading to Matajap and conquering several areas in the southern of Sumatra. The Minangkabau language is a member of the Austronesian language family, and is closest to the Malay language, though when the two languages split from a common ancestor and the precise historical relationship between Malay and Minangkabau culture is not known. Until the 20th century the majority of the Sumatran population lived in the highlands. The highlands are well suited for human habitation, with plentiful fresh water, fertile soil, a cool climate, and valuable commodities. It is probable that wet rice cultivation evolved in the Minangkabau highlands long before it appeared in other parts of Sumatra, and predates significant foreign contact. Aditya Warman, a follower of Tantric Buddhism with ties to the Singasari and Majapahit kingdoms of Java, is believed to have founded a kingdom in the Minangkabau highlands at Pagaruyung and ruled between 1347 and 1375, 232 The establishment of a royal system seems to have involved conflict and violence, eventually leading to a division of villages into one of two systems of tradition, Bodhi Kaniago and Koto Piliang, the latter having overt allegiances to royalty. By the 16th century, the time of the next report after the reign of Aditya Warman, royal power had been split into three recognized reigning kings. They were the king of the world, the king of Adat, and the king of religion, and collectively they were known as the kings of the three seats. The Minangkabau kings were charismatic or magical figures, but did not have much authority over the conduct of village affairs. It was around the 16th century that Islam started to be adopted by the Minangkabau. The first contact between the Minangkabau and Western nations occurred with the 1529 voyage of Jean Parmentier to Sumatra. The Dutch East India Company first acquired gold at Pariaman in 1651, but later moved south to Padang to avoid interference from the Asenas occupiers. In 1663 the Dutch agreed to protect and liberate local villages from the Asenas in return for a trading monopoly, and as a result set up trading posts at Painan and Padang. Until early in the 19th century the Dutch remained content with their coastal trade of gold and produce, and made no attempt to visit the Minangkabau highlands. As a result of conflict in Europe, the British occupied Padang from 1781 to 1784 during the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War and again from 1795 to 1819 during the Napoleonic Wars. Late in the 18th century the gold supply which provided the economic base for Minangkabau royalty began to be exhausted. Around the same time other parts of the Minangkabau economy had a period of unparalleled expansion as new opportunities for the export of agricultural commodities arose particularly with coffee which was in very high demand. A civil war started in 1803 with the Padri fundamentalist Islamic group in conflict with the traditional syncretic groups, elite families and Pagaruyung royals. As a result of a treaty with a number of Penghulu and representatives of the Minangkabau royal family, Dutch forces made their first attack on a Padre village in April 1821. 
The first phase of the war ended in 1825 when the Dutch signed an agreement with the Padre leader Twanku Imam Banjil to halt hostilities, allowing them to redeploy their forces to fight the Java War. When fighting resumed in 1832, the reinforced Dutch troops were able to more effectively attack the Padre. The main centre of resistance was captured in 1837, Twanku Imam Banjil was captured and exiled soon after, and by the end of the next year the war was effectively over. With the Minangkabau territories now under the control of the Dutch, transportation systems were improved and economic exploitation was intensified. New forms of education were introduced, allowing some Minangkabau to take advantage of a modern education system. The 20th century marked a rise in cultural and political nationalism, culminating in the demand for Indonesian independence. Later rebellions against the Dutch occupation occurred such as the 1908 anti-tax rebellion and the 1927 communist uprising. During World War II the Minangkabau territories were occupied by the Japanese, and when the Japanese surrendered in August 1945 Indonesia proclaimed independence. The Dutch attempts to regain control of the area were ultimately unsuccessful and in 1949 the Minangkabau territories became part of Indonesia as the province of central Sumatra. In February 1958, dissatisfaction with the centralist and communist-leaning policies of the Sukarno administration triggered a revolt which was centered in the Minangkabau region of Sumatra with rebels proclaiming the revolutionary government of the Republic of Indonesia in Bukidagai. The Indonesian military invaded West Sumatra in April 1958 and had recaptured major towns within the next month. A period of guerrilla warfare ensued, but most rebels had surrendered by August 1961. In the years following, West Sumatra was like an occupied territory with Javanese officials occupying most senior civilian, military, and police positions. The policies of centralization continued under the Suharto regime. The national government legislated to apply the Javanese Desa village system throughout Indonesia, and in 1983 the traditional Minangkabau Nagari village units were split into smaller Jorong units thereby destroying the traditional village social and cultural institutions. In the years following the downfall of the Suharto regime decentralization policies were implemented, giving more autonomy to provinces, thereby allowing West Sumatra to reinstitute the Nagari system. The traditional historiography or tambo of the Minangkabau tells of the development of the Minangkabau world and its adat. These stories are derived from an oral history which was transmitted between generations before the Minangkabau had a written language. The first Minangkabau are said to have arrived by ship and landed on Mount Merapi when it was no bigger than the size of an egg, which protruded from a surrounding body of water. After the waters receded the Minangkabau proliferated and dispersed to the slopes and valleys surrounding the volcano a region called the Derek. The Derek is composed of three Luhak Tanadator, Agam and Limapula Koto. The Tambo claims the ship was sailed by a descendant of Alexander the Great. A division in Minangkabau Adat into two systems is said to be the result of conflict between two half-brothers Daechuaik Ketumang Gwangan and Daechuaik Parpatian Nan Sabatang who were the leaders who formulated the foundations of Minangkabau Adat. The former accepted Aditya Warman, a prince from Majapahit, as a king while the latter considered him a minister, and a civil war ensued. 
the Bodhi Kaniago slash Adat Perpeta system formulated by Dechuaik Parpatian Nan Sabatang is based upon egalitarian principles with all Peng Hulu being equal while the Koto Pai Liang slash Adat K Tumang Guangan system is more autocratic with there being a hierarchy of Peng Hulu. Each village in the Derek was an autonomous republic and governed independently of the Minangkabau kings using one of the two Adat systems. After the Derek was settled, new outside settlements were created and ruled using the Koto Pai Liang system by Raju who were representatives of the king. Minangkabau have large corporate descent groups, but they traditionally reckon descent matrilineally. A young boy, for instance, has his primary responsibility to his mother's and sister's clans. It is considered customary and ideal for married sisters to remain in their parental home, with their husbands having a sort of visiting status. Not everyone lives up to this ideal, however. In the 1990s, Anthropologist Evelyn Blackwood studied a relatively conservative village in Sumatra Bharat where only about 22% of the households were matri houses, consisting of a mother and a married daughter or daughters. Nonetheless, there is a shared ideal among Minangkabau in which sisters and unmarried lineage members try to live close to one another or even in the same house. Land holding is one of the crucial functions of the suku. Because Minangkabau men, like Asena's men, often migrate to seek experience, wealth, and commercial success, the women's kin group is responsible for maintaining the continuity of the family and the distribution and cultivation of the land. These family groups, however, are typically led by a penghulu elected by groups of lineage leaders. With the agrarian base of the Minangkabau economy in decline, the suku as a land-holding unit has also been declining somewhat in importance, especially in urban areas. Indeed, the position of Penghulu is not always filled after the death of the incumbent, particularly if lineage members are not willing to bear the expense of the ceremony required to install a new Penghulu. The Minangs are the world's largest matrilineal society, properties such as land and houses are inherited through female lineage and guarded by clanmen. This custom is called Adat Perpeta. Some scholars argue that this might have caused the diaspora of Minangkabau males throughout the maritime Southeast Asia to become scholars or to seek fortune as merchants. However, the native Minangkabaus agreed that this matrilineal culture is indeed the result of diaspora. With their men traveling out of the country for unspecified time, it is only logical to hand the land and property to those who do not have to leave it the women. This also ensures the women's welfare and hence ensuring their offspring's welfare. Besides, native Minangkabas argue that men can live anywhere and hence they do not need a house like women do. The concept of matrilineal can be seen from the naming of important museums such as the house where Bayahamka was born by Mananjaw Lake. It has never been and never will be by Ahamka's house because it was his mother's house and passed down only to his sisters. Another museum in Bukit Tinggi was called by the locals, Muhammad Hatta's mom's house where you will see that Muhammad Hatta only had a room outside of the house, albeit attached to it. As early as the age of seven, Boys traditionally leave their homes and live in a sura to learn religious and cultural teachings. At the sura during night time, these youngsters are taught the traditional Minangkabau art of self-defense, which is Silic, or Silat in Malay. When they are teenagers, they are encouraged to leave their hometown to learn from schools or from experiences out of their hometowns so that when they are adults they can return home wise and useful for the society and can contribute their thinking and experience to run the family or nagari when they sit as the member of council of uncles. 
This tradition has created Minang communities in many Indonesian cities and towns, which nevertheless are still tied closely to their homeland. A state in Malaysia named Negeri Sembilan is heavily influenced by Minang culture because Negeri Sembilan was originally Minang Kabau's colony. The traditions of Sharia in which inheritance laws favor males and indigenous female-oriented adat are often depicted as conflicting forces in Minang Kabau society. The male-oriented Sharia appears to offer young men something of a balance against the dominance of law in local villages, which forces a young man to wait passively for a marriage proposal from some young woman's family. By acquiring property and education through Maranta experience, a young man can attempt to influence his own destiny in positive ways. Increasingly, married couples go off on Maranta, in such situations, the woman's role tends to change. When married couples reside in urban areas or outside the Minangkabau region, women lose some of their social and economic rights and property. One apparent consequence is an increased likelihood of divorce. Minangkabau were prominent among the intellectual figures in the Indonesian independence movement. Not only were they strongly Islamic, and like every other Sumatran, they are culturally and naturally proud people, they also have traditional belief of egalitarianism of standing as tall, sitting as low. They speak a language closely related to Bahasa Indonesia, which was considerably freer of hierarchical connotations than Javanese. Partly because of their tradition of Maranta, Minangkabau developed a cosmopolitan bourgeoisie that readily adopted and promoted the ideas of an emerging nation-state. Due to their culture that stresses the importance of learning, Minang people are overrepresented in the educated professions in Indonesia, with many ministers from Minang. In addition to being renowned as merchants, the Minangs have produced some of Indonesia's most influential poets, writers, statesmen, scholars, and religious scholars. Being fervent Muslims, many of them embraced the idea of incorporating Islamic ideals into modern society. Furthermore, the presence of these intellectuals combined with the people's basically proud character, made the Minangkabau homeland one of the powerhouses in the Indonesian struggle for independence. Minangkabau ceremonies and festivals include Traditional Minangkabau music includes Suluan Jo Dendang which consists of singing to the accompaniment of a Suluan bamboo flute and Talampung Gong Chime music. Dances include the Tari Piring, Tari Payung, and Tari Indang. Demonstrations of the Silat martial art are performed. Padato Adat are ceremonial orations performed at formal occasions. Rande is a folk theatre tradition which incorporates music, singing, dance, drama and the Silat martial art. Rande is usually performed for traditional ceremonies and festivals, and complex stories may span a number of nights. It is performed as a theater in the round to achieve an equality and unity between audience members and the performers. Rande performances are a synthesis of alternating martial arts dances, songs, and acted scenes. Stories are delivered by the acting and singing and are mostly based upon Minangkabau legends and folktales. Rande originated early in the 20th century out of fusion of local martial arts, storytelling, and other performance traditions. Men originally played male and female characters in the story but, since the 1960s, women have participated. Particular Minangkabau villages specialize in cottage industries producing handicrafts such as woven sugarcane and reed purses, gold and silver jewelry using filigree and granulation techniques, woven songkit textiles, wood carving, embroidery, pottery, and metallurgy. 
The staple ingredients of the Mai Nanka Bao diet are rice, fish, coconut, green leafy vegetables and chili. Meat is mainly limited to special occasions, and beef and chicken are most commonly used. Pork is not halal and not consumed, while lamb, goat and game are rarely consumed for reasons of taste and availability. Spiciness is a characteristic of Mai Nanka Bao food. The most commonly used herbs and spices are chili, turmeric, ginger, and galangal. Vegetables are consumed two or three times a day. Fruits are mainly seasonal, although fruits such as banana, papaya, and citrus are continually available. Three meals a day are typical with lunch being the most important, except during the fasting month of Ramadan when lunch is not eaten. Meals commonly consist of steamed rice, a hot fried dish and a coconut milk dish, with a little variation from breakfast to dinner. Meals are generally eaten from a plate using the fingers of the right hand. Snacks are more frequently eaten by people in urban areas than in villages. Western food has had little impact upon Mai Nanka Bao consumption and preference. To run Mandi Baby Blessing Ceremony, Sunat Rasul Circumcision Ceremony, Baralak Wedding Ceremony, Badagak Pangula Clan Leader Inauguration Ceremony. Other clan leaders, all relatives in the same clan and all villagers in the region are invited. The ceremony lasts for seven days or more, to run Kasawa Community Work Ceremony, Manyabik Harvesting Ceremony, Hari Rayo Islamic Festivals, Adoption Ceremony, Adat Ceremony, Funeral Ceremony, Wild Boar Hunt Ceremony, Manta Pabuko and Sending Food to Mother-in-Law for Ramadhan. Rendang is a dish which is considered to be a characteristic of Mai Nanka Bao culture, it is cooked four five times a year. Other characteristic dishes include Assam Pade, Soto Padong, Sait Padong, Dendang Balado. Food has a central role in the Mai Nanka Bao ceremonies which honor religious and life cycle rites. Mai Nanka Bao food is popular among Indonesians and restaurants are present throughout Indonesia. Nasi Padang restaurants, named after the capital of West Sumatra, are known for placing a variety of Mai Nanka Bao dishes on a customer's table with rice and billing only for what is taken. Nasi Kapa is another restaurant variant which specializes in dishes using offal and tamarind to add a sourness to the spicy flavor. Rima Gedeng or Rima Beganjang are the traditional homes of the Mai Nanka Bao. The architecture, construction, internal and external decoration, and the functions of the house reflect the culture and values of the Mai Nanka Bao. A Rima Gedeng serves as a residence, a hall for family meetings, and for ceremonial activities. The Rima Gedeng is owned by the women of the family who live their ownership is passed from mother to daughter. The houses have dramatic curved roof structures with multi-tiered, upswept gables. They are also well distinguished by their roof lines which curve upward from the middle and end in points in imitation of the upward curving horns of the water buffalo that supposedly eat the people their name. Shuttered windows are built into walls incised with profuse painted floral carvings. The term Rumage Dane usually refers to the larger communal homes, however, smaller single residences share many of its architectural elements. Mai Nanka Bao culture has a long history of oral traditions. One is the Padeto Adat which are performed by Panghulu at formal occasions such as weddings, funerals, adoption ceremonies, and Panghulu inaugurations. These ceremonial orations consist of many forms including Pantun, aphorisms, proverbs, religious advice, parables, two-line aphorisms, and similes. 
Minangkabau traditional folktales consist of narratives that present the social and personal consequences of either ignoring or observing the ethical teachings and the norms embedded in the adat. The storyteller recites the story in poetic or lyrical prose while accompanying himself on a rabab. A theme in Minangkabau folktales is the central role mothers and motherhood has in Minangkabau society, with the folktales Rancake Dilabua and Malin Kundang being two examples. Rancake Dilabua is about a mother who acts as teacher and advisor to her two growing children. Initially her son is vain and headstrong and only after her perseverance does he become a good son who listens to his mother. Malin Kundang is about the dangers of treating your mother badly. A sailor from a poor family voyages to seek his fortune, becoming rich and marrying. After refusing to recognize his elderly mother on his return home, being ashamed of his humble origins, he is cursed and dies when a storm ensues and turn him along with his ship to stone. The said stone is in Air Manus Beach and is known by locals as Batu Malin Kundang. Other popular folktales also relate to the important role of the woman in Minangkabau society. In the Sindhu Amato epic the woman is the source of wisdom, while in the Sabai Nan Aluah she is more a doer than a thinker. Sindhu Amato is about the traditions of Minangkabau royalty. The story involves a mythical Minangkabau queen, Bundo Kanduang who embodies the behaviors prescribed by Adat. Sindhu Amato, a servant of the queen, uses magic to defeat hostile outside forces and save the kingdom. Sabai Nan Alua is about a girl named Sabai who avenges the murder of her father by a powerful and evil ruler from a neighboring village. After her father's death, her cowardly elder brother refuses to confront the murderer and so Sabai decides to take matters into her own hands. She seeks out the murderer and shoots him in revenge. The Minangkabau language is an Austronesian language belonging to the Malayic linguistic subgroup, which in turn belongs to the Malayo-Polynesian branch. The Minangkabau language is closely related to the Negeri Sembilan Malay language used by the people of Negeri Sembilan, many of which are descendants of Minangkabau immigrants. The language has a number of dialects and sub-dialects, but native Minangkabau speakers generally have no difficulty understanding the variety of dialects. The differences between dialects are mainly at the phonological level though some lexical differences also exist. Minangkabau dialects are regional, consisting of one or more villages, and usually correspond to differences in customs and traditions. Each sub-village has its own sub-dialect consisting of subtle differences which can be detected by native speakers. The Padong dialect has become the lingua franca for people of different language regions. The Minangkabau society has a diglossia situation, whereby they use their native language for everyday conversations, while the Indonesian language is used for most formal occasions, in education and in writing, even to relatives and friends. The Minangkabau language was originally written using the JY script, an adapted Arabic alphabet. Romanization of the language dates from the 19th century, and a standardized official orthography of the language was published in 1976. Despite widespread use of Indonesian, they have their own mother tongue. The Minangkabau language shares many similar words with Malay, yet it has a distinctive pronunciation and some grammatical differences rendering it unintelligible to Malay speakers. Animism had been an important component of Minangkabau culture. Even after the penetration of Islam into Minangkabau society in the 16th century, animistic beliefs were not extinguished. In this belief system, people were said to have two souls, a real soul and a soul which can disappear called the Samangat. 
Samangat represents the vitality of life and it is said to be possessed by all living creatures including animals and plants. An illness may be explained as the capture of the Samangat by an evil spirit, and a shaman may be consulted to conjure invisible forces and bring comfort to the family. Sacrificial offerings can be made to placate the spirits, and certain objects such as amulets are used as protection. Until the rise of the Padri movement late in the 18th century, Islamic practices such as prayers, fasting and attendance at mosques had been weekly observed in the Minangkabau Highlands. The Padri were inspired by the Wahhabi movement in Mecca and sought to eliminate societal problems such as tobacco and opium smoking, gambling, and general anarchy by ensuring the tenets of the Quran were strictly observed. All Minangkabau customs allegedly in conflict with the Quran were to be abolished. Although the Padri were eventually defeated by the Dutch, during this period the relationship between Adat and religion was reformulated. Previously Adat were said to be based upon appropriateness and propriety, but this was changed so that Adat was more strongly based upon Islamic precepts. With the Minangkabau Highlands being the heartland of their culture, and with Islam likely entering the region from coast it is said that custom descended, religion ascended. Over half of the Minangkabau people can be considered overseas Minangkabas. They make up the majority of the population of Negeri Sembilan and Pekanbaru. They also form a significant minority in the populations of Jakarta, Bandung, Medan, Batam, Surabaya and Palembang in Indonesia as well as Kuala Lumpur, Malacca, Penang, Singapore and Brunei Darussalam in the rest of the Malay world. Minangkabas have also emigrated as skilled professionals and merchants to the Netherlands, United States, Saudi Arabia, and Australia. In the overseas, they have a reputation for being shrewd merchants. The matrilineal culture and economic conditions in West Sumatra have made the Minangkabau people one of the most mobile ethnic group in maritime Southeast Asia. For most of the Minangkabau people, wandering is an ideal way to reach maturity and success, as a consequence, they exercised great influence in the politics of many kingdom and states in maritime Southeast Asia. Overseas Minangkabau are also great influence developing Malaysian and Singaporean culture, mainly language, culinary, music, and martial art. The Minangkabau are known as a society that places top priority in high education and thus they are widespread across Indonesia and foreign countries in a variety of professions and expertise such as politicians, writers, scholars, teachers, journalists, and business people. Based on a relatively small population, Minangkabau is one of the most successful. According to Tempo magazine, Six of the top ten most influential Indonesians of the 20th century were Minang. Three out of the four Indonesian founding fathers are Minangkabau people. Many of Minangkabau people held prominent positions in the Indonesian and Malay nationalist movement. In 1920-1960, the political leadership in Indonesian was replete with Minangkabau people, such as Mohamed Hatta a former Indonesian government prime minister and vice president, Agus Salim a former Indonesian government minister, Tan Melaka international communist leader and founder of Peri and Merba, Sutan Sharar a former Indonesian government prime minister and founder of Socialist Party of Indonesia, Mohamed Netsir a former Indonesian government prime minister and founder of Masiamai. Asad a former Indonesian president, and Abdul Halim a former Indonesian government prime minister. During the liberal democracy era, Minangkabau politician dominated Indonesian parliament and cabinets. They were diversely affiliated to all of the existing factions, such as Islamist, 
nationalist, socialist and communist. My Nankaba writers and journalists have made significant contributions to modern Indonesian literature. These include authors Mara Rosli, Abdul Muis, Sutan Takdur Alis Yabana, Idris, Hamka, and Ali Akbar Navis, poets Muhammad Yaman, Cheryl Anwar, and Taufik Ismail, and journalists Jamaluddin Adanagoro, Rossi Han Anwar, and Ani Idris. Many prominent Indonesian novels were written by Minangkabau writers and later influenced the development of modern Indonesian language. Moreover, there are also significant number of Minangkabau people in the popular entertainment industry, such as movie directors Usmer Ismail and Nasri Chepi, movie producer Jamaluddin Malik and Myra Lasmana, screenwriter Irizal and Ashral Sani actor and actress Zoe Carno M. Noer, Christine Hakim, Camelia Malik, Eva Arnaz, Niran Azubir, Titi Raju Bintong, and Dude Herlino, as well as singers Fariz R.M., Bunga Citralstri, Najral Iram, Dors Gamalama, Afghan Saya Reza, and Sharina Munaf. Nowadays, besides Chinese Indonesian, my Nankabao people have made significant contributions to Indonesia's economic activities. My Nankabao businessmen are also notable in hospitality sector, media industry, healthcare, publisher, automotive, and textile trading. My Nankabao businessmen also prominent in traditional My Nankabao cuisine restaurant chains in many cities of Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Australia. Notable successes include Abdul Ladyaf and Bas Rizal Koto. Historically, My Nangs had also settled outside West Sumatra, migrating as far as the South Philippines by the 14th century. Raja Bajindo was the leader of the forming polity in Sulu, Philippines, which later turned into the Sultanate of Sulu. The Minangkabaws migrated to the Malay Peninsula in the 14th century and began to take control of the local politics. In 1773 Raja Malwar was appointed the first head of state of Negeri Sembilan. My Nankabas have been filled many political positions in Malaysia and Singapore, namely the first president of Singapore, Yusuf Ishak, the first supreme head of state of the Federation of Malaya, Tuanku Abdul Rahman, and many of Malaysian government minister, such as Aisha Ghani, Amir Sham Abdul Aziz, Aziz Ishak, Ghazali Shafi, and Rice Yadim. They are also great contributing on Malaysian and Singaporean socio-cultural, such as Zubir said, who composed Majula Singapura, Wandli Yazid, the Singaporean musician, the Malaysian film director, Yue Haji Sari, the language expert, Zainal Abidin Ahmed, as well as business and economic activities such as Mohammed Tabe bin Haji Abdul Samad, Mokzani Mahadir, and Tunku Tan Sri Abdullah. Notable people of Minangkabau descent outside of Malay world include member of the House of Representatives of the Netherlands, Rustam Effendi, Ahmed Khatib, the Imam of the Shafi'i School of Law at Masjid al-Haram, and Khatib's grandson Fuad Abdul Hamid al-Khatib as Saudi Arabian ambassador.